Alright. So, have you gotten a DUI? Yes, I have. I've had six DWIs over my lifetime. Um, how, what was, like, the streak do you get? The streak was, um, I got three DWIs, and then I was clean for about eight years, and then I started drinking again, and I got three more. What stopped you for those seven, eight years? Um... I, we were having a lot of pro I was having a lot of problems due to my alcoholism and um my parents wanted me to go into a rehab and uh I went into rehab and then I went into a halfway house for six months to relearn how to live sober and how to meet people and how to network yourself sober um and I, I made life clean and sober for eight years, and um, I was very happy. Mm -hmm. What, what made you start again? Start drinking again? <laughs> um, it was kind of due to my family. I, I, I don't know how to explain it. I moved back home. Um, I had a, I had a baby when I was sober, and um, I lived in Wallingford with my baby with my son. And um, at some point, my father came and asked me if I'd move back home, so I could better my life and go to college, finish college. And um, I moved back home, and it was too easy for me to live there. And, um, I had a built-in babysitting, excuse me, built-in baby babysitting system there, and, um, I was going to college, and you meet people, and I started drinking again. So, do you consider your, yourself an alcoholic during this time? Yes, absolutely. What age, do you, do you remember what age you started drinking at, about? About 17. And was there any other substance or drugs that you used before then? Yeah, I smoked pot from probably about 14 or 15. Was and eventually I started drinking. So that was your gateway drug? Yes, absolutely. What led you to smoking pot or and drinking? Um... Peer pressure, I, I maybe not peer pressure, but just doing what everyone else was doing. You know, going to keg parties, being, you know, part of the keg, and I just liked it. You know, once I was doing it, I liked it, thought it was cool, and I wasn't having any problems yet. So, what crowd would you say you were in at the time when you started? Oh, um, I went to Cog and Chuck, and, um, I kind of was in a lot of the groups, you know, I was very easy going and I was a cheerleader but I was also part of the pit crew because I smoked cigarettes and I went outside to smoke and we smoked pot right outside in those days. The pit was there in the school where it was a lot of smoke during breaks, correct? Yes, yes. And at, like after lunch you would go out there and be able to smoke and they had, you know, there was always... 10, 20 people out there, you know, laughing, you know, that's where you found out where the keg party was that night, and, you know, things like that. Yeah. What happened to you with the DUI situation? Um, my first three DWIs, which were early on in the 80s, um, not the first one I went, I think I went to like a 12 week class, paid a fine. The second one I went to, um, I had to do community service and then I went to like a 24 week class and um, these, mm -hmm. the classes cost like 500 bucks to get into them. Um, the, the, set, the laws really weren't that severe back in the 80s. So it didn't really detour you from 
to getting another one. Yeah. You know, there wasn't like any big threat of going to jail or anything like that with the DWI then. Yeah. Um, like I said, that was in the 80s. I graduated in 83, so. Yeah. <coughs> so, when you, you were with your parents that time, right? In high school. Yeah. Yeah. And you were with your parents shortly after. Class. Yes, I lived with my parents for most of my life. And then when you moved out, was that because of the DUIs or? When I moved out the first time, I moved out to, with my son, I, I moved out with him to get out of the town of Durham because the people there, the people that I associated with and everything weren't good for me and it, I needed to get out of that town and, and away from my parents. Get away from the pit crew, essentially. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And then, so what, how do you mo end up moving back to your parents? Um... I think we already said this. Maybe we didn't. Um, when I was um, living in Wallingford with my son, um, my father, you know, we, I, I wasn't making a ton of money. It was just me and my son. And um, my father came there and asked me to move back home so he could help us and so I could go return to college and maybe finish my college career. So... When you went back to college, that's when you got back into the party scene? That's when I started drinking again when I went back to college. Did you associate with the pit crew once again? Um, it was kind of a little different. The, the, they didn't really have groups there. They did, but it wasn't the same But like your friends, high school. Your friends from high school, you knew them because you were back in your old town. Right, exactly. So you, and, of course, you get to know the people that drink and stuff when you're in classes and, you know, um, I majored in science and things like that and you got to know the people that were getting high or, you know, doing whatever and... So your social group of drinkers and... I got back right in a group with people that smoked pot and drank and... And it grew larger because now you're not limited to the pit crew, now you're right. in college. Now you're in a big group with other people and there's other drugs there and... You know, the parties are big, you're, you're of age to drink now, and you're an adult, you know. So, this is where the DUI started again, I'm guessing? Yes. Yes. Um, I got another DWI about 2001, May, around there, around 2000, I'm not sure, the first one I got after being cleaned. Um, and they kind of just slapped my hands. They, they, it wasn't that bad. They, I hadn't had any problems in over ten years on my record, so they looked at my now this day, this TWI as like it was my first. So they kind of just slapped my hand and, mm -hmm. you know, I had to go to classes and do this and that and, you know, I always successfully completed things. I mean, I I I was a good student in high school and in drunk class. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, when did your parents start to get fed up with your DUIs and excessive drinking? Um, I was living with them. Obviously, they were they were always very um, you know, we were always very close and everything. But they started getting fed up because I had my son, and um, you know, I I was drinking again, and, um, I would say it was probably about 2000, Something. 99, 2000, I'd say it was around there, and, um, yeah, they wanted me to go to rehab and do different things, and I didn't really want to go, and, um, Go ahead. So, 
you were going, they were fouling with you with rehab and trying to get you to stop drinking yeah. because of your son. Because of my son, yeah. And they're, they're, I guess, their life too. I, I don't know. You know, I lived with them, so. But yeah, they battled with me because of my son. You know, I mean, I never. I usually went out to the bar drinking. I didn't drink at home. Um, I waited, put him to bed, and then, and then went out. You know. So then it wasn't like you were leaving him behind. Right. With a babysitter or leaving him home alone or anything like that. And then you weren't bringing him to that environment also. Right. He wasn't involved in it. He didn't know what I was doing. He was young. Yeah. You know, he was kindergarten, first grade at this point. And your parents were acting as babysitters? Babysitters. Built in babysitter, you know, and they never minded. He was usually asleep when I went out. So it wasn't like they were hands-on babysitters. Yeah. You know, but still, they didn't like the whole thing. Did and I'd come home late at night. Yeah. You know, or early in the morning. And, you know, I'd like... When he got went to school, I'd be there in the morning. When he went off to school. Yeah. So. Did they ever try to throw you out at any point? Um... Yes, um, we got to a point where, um, I was drinking one day at home, and I got in a fight with my mother, and, um, my, and then my father got involved in it, and we went back and forth and back and forth, I got in a fight physically with my father, they got me arrested. And they took my son away from me. And I had to move out, obviously. They didn't want me to live there anymore. And, um, because I had was arrested and in jail, they got, they said I abandoned him. Which was the farthest thing from the truth. But, it looked good on paper, and the judge bought it. Bought it. Then that was the worst part of my whole life. And it didn't make me stop drinking. It made me drink more. Because I didn't have my baby anymore. I mean, he, he wasn't a baby anymore, but... He was my whole life. And I didn't know what to do with when I didn't have him. And it made, it made me drink more. It made me become more of a severe alcoholic. I drank every day then. You know, it's like I didn't have him when I woke up. I didn't have him when I went to bed. I didn't have, I didn't know what he was doing. You know, I mean, I knew they were taking good care of him and everything, but. You didn't have your stability. Yeah. You know, he kept me, even if I was drinking it, he kept me from being worse. Worse. You know, and not caring. You know, I cared. What I didn't have and I didn't care. You know, and it didn't... Uh, no matter what I did, it didn't make it better. Then no matter what I did, they weren't going to give it back to me. You know, and um, I tried, went into rehab, I went into... You know, I ended up living in shelters. I had no... I had no place to go. I'm an only child. I didn't have anyone. You know, the only people I had was my parents and my son. They wouldn't, I didn't have them anymore. It was kind of just me alone. And not to repeat myself, but yeah, I started drinking more to just not think about it. You know, you know, I, I didn't want to think about it. I hated it. And like I said, no matter what I did, what I did it didn't matter. You know, they wouldn't let me talk to him. They wouldn't let me see him. They notified the school that if I came there to call the police, um, I never would hurt him, ever. And for them to have the, the school call the police if I came there was like, it just ripped my heart out, you know, that they would think that I would go there and hurt him or something. And I guess maybe it was more that they thought I was going to take him. Yeah. 
you know. That would be understandable. And I did. I wanted to take him. You know, I wanted to go there and take him. But, I, you know, I didn't have a great place to live. You know, I moved in with a girlfriend right off the bat and, you know, tried to get things together. But if you're living with someone else that's drinking, too, Doesn't there's bound to be problems, <laughs> you know. And at that point, they weren't, you know, let me have them on the weekends or anything like that. So it was, you know, and sometimes I lived in places that I wouldn't bring him. You know, I lived with people that I wouldn't have my son around. You know, I, I always protected him from the whole environment of, you know, like I said, I, I never really drank at home and I kept it out of his mindset. Yeah, you know, I mean, he probably knew that I um, drank. I'm not sure I never really asked him at that age. But he sure knew after that he took him away from me. <laughs> you know? So, um, let's go on. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So, what was the next step in your life, essentially? Um, I went to rehab. I went to a couple rehabs. I was in and out. And, um, I, um, ran into an old friend that I went to have and check with. <coughs> we essentially went to kindergarten through <coughs> high school. And, um, he drank. At that point, I was battling with not drinking, wanting to drink, not wanting to drink. Here's my little peanut over here. <laughs> um, but he drank alcoholically. And um, I was kind of like... In between. In between. And off. Right, exactly. On and off. I was seeing my son. I was having him on the weekend. We were, you know, we had started a new um, relationship, a new... Way of life. Way of life. You know, he, he was happy to come and see me. And happy for me. <laughs> You know, he was happy to come and see me and stay over the weekends, and, you know, it, it was great. And, of course, when he was there, I never drank, you know, or anything like that. I tried to make the weekends the best thing, he, you know, he had. And um, did you get any more DUIs after? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> um, I got another DUI, and that was my third after the first three that were a long time ago. And, um, this time it wasn't so funny. The laws had changed so severely that I ended up going to jail for six months, which was a real shock. I really didn't expect that. After getting slaps on the wrist for your whole life. Yeah, exactly. You know, all of a sudden it was like, wham, you're, in j you're going to jail for six months and there's nothing you can do about it. You know, I said, can I go to rehab? Can I do this? Can I, you know, I can't go to jail. Yeah. Um, and then I ended up, they, they, I had to do six months mandatory, which meant I couldn't get my sentence reduced. I had to do the whole six months. No good behavior. Not good behavior. Nothing could get, yeah. I was mandatory. So, uh, I went to Niantic. That was really scary. I mean, I never lived like that. You know, there was murderers there, and well, all the women in Connecticut that do anything wrong are there. Mm -hmm. You know, there's only one women's prison. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that was a real shocker. That was, you know, I was really embarrassed. I had to tell my son I was in jail, or that I was going to jail, you know. Was that the first time he was exposed to that side of... Yeah. I, I pretty much think so, that it was never, you know, he knew I drank and stuff, but he didn't think that it was that severe, severe, you know, and, um, yeah, I had to do six months in, in Niantic, it was, it was quite the, uh, wake culture up shock, yeah, wake up call, hello, <laughs> hello, 
So what happened with the per your friend you met from Cognitrack? Well, me and Colin ended up getting married. Well, while I was in jail, Colin got his third DWI, and he had to go to jail for six months. So I got out of jail, and he went in. Um, we got married in between. His six, my six months and his six months, we got married. And um, we got an apartment and um, set it up and all that. And then he went to jail. So I was there alone. I was there alone. Mommy's doing something, okay? And, um, you want to go see Daddy? Go see Daddy. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. That was Emily. <laughs> <laughs> she just woke up. <laughs> How old is she now? She is, uh, two years and four months. She's our peanut. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so, uh, yeah, it was quite, my, my husband Colin had never been in jail either, he had to do six months, you know, but it never, it didn't stop either of us from, from drinking, yeah, because we both got out and drank, yeah, how was life so, without him for oh, six months? Oh, it was, it was, it was, it was very lonely, you know, it was sad because I knew what he was going through because I had just done it. You know, when you're in jail, you're in jail. There's no friends or, you know, yeah, you make friends, but, you know, these people aren't your friends. <laughs> you know, it's like, so, um, I, um, got this apartment, me and my husband, and set it up. And, um, I was still drinking. And, um, I had a job and everything. And, um, I went out one night, and, um, got really drunk. Came home, and it was morning. It was light out. And somehow in that evening, I lost my keys to my apartment. And, um, I went downstairs and asked the manager if I could get a key or whatever. And it's in our, it was in our lease that you had to pay $5 for the key if you lost it. Well, I didn't have the five dollars because I obviously spent all my money drinking. There was a window. Uh, we lived on the third floor, and there was a window in our hallway, and there was a ledge about this big around the building. So, um, I opened the window and I went out on the ledge because the ledge led around to my living room window, and I knew I could get in the apartment. So I um. About how high up was this? What'd you guess? Um, about 35 to 40 feet. It was a big Victorian house. Um, and I got to my living room window and I started opening it and the guy that lived next door to me stuck his head out the window and started talking to me because it was pretty weird to see some lady walking around on a ledge at 9 o'clock in the morning. So, um, I started talking to him and the next thing I know I was in Harford Hospital. And, um, I was in a coma for, um, induced a coma. They put me into a coma because I had a lot of internal injuries and they couldn't do anything with my back until they fixed that. So, um, I was in Hartford Hospital for about a month. Then they transferred me to Gaylord for about seven months. Um, it's a pretty yucky situation. Um, but that's what alcohol did. It put me in this wheelchair. For the rest of my life, I'm paralyzed from the waist down. Um, I make the best of it. You know, I have a good life still. But I did say to myself a lot, you know, why didn't God just take me? Why did he put me in this chair with so much pain and agony? And, um, he must have had something in store for me. Well, what you hear in the background. Yeah, exactly. What you hear in the background is what he had in store for me. <laughs> and, um, one day, I had a lot of general injuries, so, you know, some stuff is not in the right places, it seems like. So, um, stuff kept moving in my stomach for a 
felt like it was moving. And um, I have a pump in my stomach with morphine as it pumps through my body. So, you know, there's different stuff. Well, one night I, my husband came home and I said, Colin, you know, there's stuff moving in my stomach. You know, you think I should call my doctor? I had a nurse that came in weekly. Um, and he was like, yeah, all right. There's stuff moving in my stomach. Well, the next morning we got up and he was getting ready to work and I said, Colin, come here, come here, come here. He's moving again. And he called an ambulance immediately. And I went to the hospital emergency room and they told me I was pregnant. And um, we found out that I was six months pregnant. Um, my husband still was drinking. I hadn't drank at all since my ass that night. Don't ever want to. But I was smoking pot and I'm on a lot, on a lot of heavy, heavy medications. Um, just the morphine is a, you know, heavy medication. And, um, I have to go off a lot, most of my medications. Um, but I, I, I smoked pot, so, even though I knew I was pregnant. Which was in a good mood. But, I did. And, um, I went into the hospital to have Emily. And, um, I guess they took blood from me and the baby. I, I don't know really how it happened, but somehow DCF got involved and they took the baby away from us. Which is very, very traumatic. I mean, I have a wonderful son that I love more than anything, and he's not with me, and now I just. And now they just took my new baby. Yeah. So, um. They gave us a list of things. It was like, it was just horrible. You know, my parents were upset. Everyone was upset. And this is the little princess now. <laughs> She's a bit tired. Can you say hi? Hi. Say hi. Hi. Mom's right here. Don't worry about it. Um, so they, we had to do all kinds of things. We had to go into rehab. We had to do parenting classes. We had, um, I mean, it was just a Marriott of things. But we did everything immediately. And we didn't play any games. You know, we said, we got to test up, we got to do this, and we got to get that baby back. And, um, we did. We, we, um, DCF said usually infants you don't get back to, for at least a year or more. Um, because they can't tell what's going on where a child usually can say they hit me or where an infant can't. You know, and they didn't know if we were going to be drinking or what we were going to do after we got back. Um, my husband quit drinking. He went into rehab, quit drinking. Um, I went into rehab and stopped smoking pot. Like I said, to this day, I have not drank at all. Alcohol made every problem I've had in my life was due to alcohol or drugs. Um, it took me a long time to learn. I have a hard head on And, um... I have a wonderful son that I love more than anything. Now I have this little one here. Um, sometimes it's a little difficult with a two-year-old in a wheelchair. <laughs> and she plays a lot of games because she knows I can't catch her. <laughs> but she's just wonderful. And um, things are going really good. You know, we're really trying hard. And you know, we just have a normal life, finally. You know, finally. We, we didn't know what normal was. My parents were alcoholics. My father was an alcoholic. My mother never drank. Colin's parents both were alcoholics. We grew up in alcoholic homes. We didn't know what, what normal was. You know, normal to us was people pounding drinks and being drunk. and So, you know, we ended up that way, too. We didn't know anything different. So, um, we learned. Different. Another way. And um, it, it's, it's working. I'm very happy. You know, I've never been straight for three and a half, four years of my life. You know? And it's not even hard anymore. You know, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. You know, I can um, talk to my parents and not be uh, afraid. I can have my son over and not have to not drink for the weekend or, you know. 
seems like she's pretty happy to accept for how you didn't watch Barney with her. Yeah, Barney's her buddy. Yeah, she she's pretty attached to me. But yeah, she's very happy. She smiles all the time. She wakes up with a smile on her face, and it just it's wonderful to wake up that way and see her. You know, and know I have a whole rest of my life to teach her how to live. You know, my son's wonderful. He doesn't drink. He's not into drugs. Thank God. I don't want him to have the life that I have. You know, it, it, when you look back, it was not all that fun <laughs> as I thought it was. You know, when we were doing it, it seemed like it was fun. But, um... So, I only have a few questions left. Sure. Do you agree, you're aware of the small penalties that people, well, what seems like a small penalty that someone would get for getting in an accident while drunk for whatever reason they they could kill someone but they'll only get off with manslaughter because it's an accident. It's a motor vehicle accident. Yeah. Oh, God bless you, sweetheart. Do you agree with that? I think the penalty should be stiffer. I, I really do. You know, thank God in all my accidents and drunkenness, I never, ever hurt anyone. You know, I hurt myself a few times, but I could have killed people. I could have killed the whole family. You know, I know I've driven many times in a blackout that I didn't even, you know, I woke up in the morning and said, geez, how did I get home? You know, and I look out the window to see if my car's there or if someone drove me, you know, someone drove me home. That's pretty or horrible to wake up and not know how I got home. You know, and I could have killed a whole family of people and not, you know, and woke up in jail and not even know why I was there. Yeah. You know, that's pretty scary. And it, it should be. There should be really stiff penalties. It is a disease. People have to be educated. Our children need to be educated on alcoholism. You know, and, and maybe it will make a difference. I think alcohol should be illegal. You know, but that's just my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. So for... I was about to ask, actually, do you think that alcohol should be outlawed? And for it being legal, it's caused so many deaths compared to right. most other illegal that, That's substances. the thing, even with me when I was drinking, you know, it's legal. You can walk every, every you know what I mean? One of the things also I had to learn in my life is that alcohol is not going to go away. It's going to be there forever. There's going to be package stores everywhere. You're going to go places everywhere you go, people are drinking you know, parties, and another thing is, oh, uh, your friends, your drinking buddies, your, they turn on, they, they don't want to see you anymore when you, you're sober, because you're different, and they don't want to feel like they're doing something wrong, yeah. you know, because after going to rehab and everything, it's like, you feel like you're doing something wrong if you start drinking, yeah. you know, it's like, you, you do it in secret, because you don't want people to know because you know you're an alcoholic you shouldn't be doing this but it calls you you know and like I had to learn it's not going to go away people aren't going to not drink because Ivy's there you know and the tax stores aren't going to shut down because I can't handle my drinking yeah. you know but I, I really think it should be illegal it, it ruins families it kills people it, it, it's a horrible disease to have it, it 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 haunts you though. You you know, it's very, very hard to quit. Very. You know, I mean I used to struggle. Be, you know, when I had before this, when I had tried to quit drinking and go out to rehab, you know, and be like, Okay, I'm not gonna drink today, I'm not gonna drink today, you know, I'm gonna not drink by noon I was at pack store drinking. You know, and it was this constant struggle not to go to that package store. You know, people don't understand. They think it's easy. You know, why can't, oh, you don't have willpower, or, you know, or you don't have this, or you don't have that. It, it's, it's a very, very strong, powerful disease. You know? Uh, well, do you have any more questions for me? I guess the only question I have left is, what's your name? My name is Ivy Dumont, and I'm Parker's mom. Thank you. And I'm very proud to be his mother. <laughs> Thank, Thank you for you. the interview.
thank you. Anytime.